And this man in his 60s comes up to me and says, I just won $13,000 gambling. I'd like to buy you a diamond bracelet, no strings attached. And our friends would go to the bar or go bowling. And I'd be like, no, I'd rather hang out with the president or Michael Jackson. I mean, to me, that was more interesting. And so I had been doing it. So she sent them to her email to save them. And then she was hacked. And then after getting hacked, her top of picture showed up on Hunter Moore's website, isanyoneup.com, along with her name, her city, and her social media link. But the one thing he didn't anticipate was Charlotte Laws. He came after my daughter. He needed to be brought down. I'm going to be interviewing Charlotte Laws, and uh, I actually came across uh, Charlotte's story uh, as a result of another interview and a, a documentary I saw on Netflix called, it was called, um, the most hated man uh, on the internet. It was uh, about Hunter Moore, and I, I just remember watching the interview, and I ended up talking to another guest about uh, about Charlotte, and essentially uh, Hunter Moore was just wreaking havoc and putting up, you know, well, he was organizing a hacking a scheme to hack into people's email account or people's accounts and Facebook accounts and getting, you know, uh, naked pictures and videos of people and posting it on this website. And he ended up crossing Charlotte's path and she kind of, uh, kind of, I mean, according to, I will know for sure, but according to the documentary, she turned into his worst nightmare and eventually got him indicted for what he was, for the hacking, uh, for the, the hacking scheme and ended up bringing down the, the, the site and uh, Hunter Moore, which, you know, um, as far as I could tell, a pretty despicable person. I had talked to Dan, and he said that, you know, he, he, he was saying that you had, like, a, a really interesting story and that, you know, your backstory, he, he was like, your backstory is as interesting as the, the whole Hunter Moore thing, which for you is probably just kind of a, a, a glitch. But, you know, people, like, people end up getting notoriety for things that, you know, they don't typically think of. But so, so I, I appreciate you doing this. And I guess my, my first kind of question is, you know, where were you, where were you raised? Like California? Is it? I, I, was, raised, I was actually raised in Atlanta, Georgia. And I think you well, lived there for a little while, didn't you? Um, I, I stopped by there and picked up some money. <laughs> oh, okay. I read that online on your bio, yeah. that you had, and then you spent yeah. time in Florida too. So, and I, I did as well. But I was raised in Atlanta, and um, I was a debutante, so it was the high society Atlanta, and I never fit in. I was the black sheep. I was called an end lover all the time. I was, you know, attacked and ridiculed for my views, and because I was supported the civil rights movement and that kind of thing, and most of my friends didn't. And I also had a very um, tragic family life. I was adopted at birth, but my adoptive dad was abusive, verbally abusive. My adoptive mom committed suicide, but she didn't die right away. It took her 10 years. So she was um, semi-conscious uh, in a convalescent home for 10 years. And she could only move half of her body, and she slurred her words and that kind of thing. It was really a, a really horrible situation. A suicide gone wrong, like it was a suicide where it didn't she didn't succeed, but she got brain damage, and so um, she cut her wrists and her neck and took pills in the bathtub, and it was really horrible because my little brother, who was two years younger than me, is the one who found her, and he was much closer to her than I was, and so I just felt so bad that he had to go through this horrible trauma with you know this whole thing because my mom had sent me to the mall to get tennis shoes. So I didn't get home till like seven o'clock that night. Everything had already happened. The police had already left. I mean, my dad and my brother were there, but it was like no one else was there anymore. So I missed the whole thing, you know. Frankly, I'm not too sad about that because I really wouldn't have wanted to be home for it. And then two years after that, my mom, my brother was killed in a car accident. And he was also um, adopted at birth as well. But um, my, um, my dad, after my mom committed suicide or tried to commit suicide, however you want to say it, um, the, the day after that happened, he said, you were never to visit your mother or mention her name in this house again, and he filed for divorce. 
So I had to sneak my little brother who couldn't drive because he was 14. I was 16. I had a car I could drive. I had to sneak him to the convalescent home to visit our mom behind my dad's back because he had forbidden us to see her. What? So, Do you know um, why? That seems... I think it was just, you know, he just felt it was a negative thing and he just wanted her and the entire experience out of his life. I'm guessing. I mean, I don't know. My dad was a very unemotional guy, um, a very, um, not a very nice person. He died a couple of years ago. He died actually at the beginning of COVID, but not of COVID. He was 93 years old at the time. And um, he, you know, he was verbally abusive, you know? So like when my brother died in a car accident, I was at University of Florida at that time. And so I came back to Atlanta for the funeral. And the first thing my dad said to me, he was standing in the kitchen and he said, you are always the bad one. Your brother was the good one. You're the one who should have died, not him. That's the kind of thing my dad would say to me a lot. And I still remember those words, you know? So um, I just wanted to escape as a kid. I mean, I had this horrible um, family life. My family was also very racist. It's adopted family. And, um, and then I had the community that I didn't you know, fit in and, you know, and um, luckily there were, you know, I had the television and I realized because of the TV that not everybody was like the people that I knew, you know, growing up. And I realized there were people who were not prejudiced. I, I mean, I just, you know, saw them as very open-minded. I loved the flashy clothes that entertainers would wear. So right. I was very drawn to that. And that's when I decided you know, I kind of started gravitating towards meeting people in the entertainment industry. And um, that's kind of how I started crashing events to get past security in order to meet these people that I wanted to be part of. Now, when I was going to school, I went to this private school. And the one thing I will say is the teachers were great and they were like substitute parents to me. So I would go to their houses and I was really close to the teachers. So they were kind of like, you know, substitute parents. And then the entertainment industry became substitute family for me after that. And then eventually I tracked down my, my birth family and um, have since come to believe that genetics are much stronger than environment because I'm much more like them than I ever was my adopted family. Well, so how, how old were you when you started crashing these, you know, political or not political, um, the uh, parties? Yeah, I was, um, I think the first thing I crashed was um, when I was 16, I went to a Jerry Lee Lewis concert. He's kind of like a rock and roll country-ish type singer. Yeah, and I, I only went because I had had a crush on the singer Tom Jones since I was nine years old. And I okay. read an article that Tom said that that was his favorite performer. So I thought, okay, I'll go to this show because I, I didn't know who Jerry Lee Lewis was. So I went to the um, show and it was sold out. And rather than go home, I thought, well, I got to get inside. And that was my first crashing. And I said, I'm here to apply for a job. And the guy at the door says, oh, okay, we'll go on in and go to the left and go to that office. And so I walked in, I went right, and I sat down on the front row of the auditorium. But that night ended up kind of changing my life because I watched the show. And when the show was over, this man came up to me his name was JD, the white haired guy. And he said, um, would you like to go backstage? And I said, sure, why not? So he took me back to Jerry Lee's dressing room, which really was kind of this makeshift dressing room with curtains that was on the back of the stage. And um, there were a few other people in there. And he, you know, we chit chatted for two minutes. And then he said, I need to change clothes. We can either wait here or wait outside. And I said, I'll wait outside, thank you. And so I went back to the audience, which was completely empty now, and I sat down, and this guy, J.D., came out and sat next to me, and he said, Jerry Lee would like to be in your company this evening. And I said, oh, well, I don't want to go out with him. And he goes, really? All the girls want to go out with him. <laughs> and I said, no. And then he said, um, well, who would you want to go out with? And he started listing all the sex symbols of the day, you know, John Travolta or Robert Redford, whoever they were. And I was like, no, no. And he said, isn't there anyone? And I said, well, I would like to go out with Tom Jones. And he said, well, you can do it. You know, you're pretty and you're, you know, he built up my confidence. And he right. said, Jerry Lee wanted to go out with you, didn't he? So 
it just kind of, it made me feel much more confident. I mean, I had very low self-esteem as a kid. I felt super ugly and fat. I was like 10 pounds overweight most of my childhood. And um, I certainly, you know, I didn't have highs of esteem, but this guy like convinced me. And I said, thank you so much. I'm going to do it. I mean, I literally gave him a hug and I started running out of the theater. And he said, well, don't you want to go back and see Jerry Lee? I said, no, I'm going to get a date with Tom. And I ran out. And then I started planning that, you know, getting a date with Tom. And I went to um, Vegas where Tom was performing a year later when I was, when I was 17 and um, ended up meeting him. He was very flirtatious. I could tell he was interested. I went through lots of shenanigans to kind of get past security so he would be able to meet me. I met his mom. I mean, I spent an entire week staying at Caesars, which is where he was performing. In fact, when I walked in the door, when I first got there, I um, went up to one of the bellhops and I said, I gave him like 20 bucks or 40 bucks, like very small amount of money. And I said, I need to know what room Tom Jones is staying in, what time he goes to the show and what path he takes to get to it. And the guy took me up and said, is this room? This is the way he goes down this hall. It's at 630 or whatever it is. And so it ended up being correct. And um, I had had this showgirl costume made which was ridiculous because I'm five feet tall, so I don't look like a showgirl, but it had feathers and sequins and silver boots, and I positioned myself in the hallway at the right time, and then I just, you know, I heard his voice in the distance with his security guard, and I just kind of started walking towards it, and he stopped, and he flirted with me, and but he never asked me out the whole week, and so then uh, almost two years later, I... You stayed there a week? I stayed and... in Vegas for a week, yeah. I mean, not just doing that, but I was doing right. it. it was like a little vacation, you know, at 17. And I used to travel when I was, before I was 18, I used to, I went to New York by myself and Chicago and my adopted dad didn't even know I was gone on, I remember my big trip for a week to Chicago and New York. He, I told my brother, but I didn't tell my dad. And my brother said, he didn't even notice you were gone. <laughs> so that's how close our family was. So, um. So anyway, so then I resumed my attempts, and I ended up dating Tom for three years. There's, there's you know, more that happened in Florida, but it was, you know, it was like a Cinderella story for me because I literally went from feeling really ugly and fat and stupid. I've always felt unintelligent my whole life. I've had a complex about that, and um, you know, here's a guy that I've been interested in for ten years. He was everything I thought he would be in person, and um, I was totally in love with him. And you know, so it was it was really kind of amazing. And um, well, okay, so you you met him at seventeen. Right. And then I started going out with him. Later you met him again? Yeah, what happened was I went to school at University of Florida in Gainesville for college. And um, my best friend in the dorm was from Fort Lauderdale. And she said that um, Tom was gonna be in Fort Lauderdale performing at Sunrise Music Theater. So um, we decided to go down and stay with her parents, which is right down the street from the theater. And I got everything arranged. So I called the theater and, um, you know, called and said, yes, we need uh, ringside seats for um, Charlotte Lodge. She's the winner of the Miss Georgia beauty pageant, and she'll be in town doing some Maybelline commercials. I mean, the whole thing was a complete lie, right? Yeah. And, they, and the manager goes, yes, ma'am, no problem. We'll get them for you. And, um, and then I even found out what hotel Tom was at and even got a room at the same hotel, just thinking, you know, at least I'll be in the proximity. And I went to the show. I ended up going by myself because my friend got sick, so she had to stay home. But I sat there. He remembered me. He had someone come out and get me, take me backstage. We went to we had dinner. We went to a discotheque. And that's how it started. So, yeah. <laughs> and I was almost 19. I was, so, yeah, I was, you know, much older by then. So but, where did he where did he live? Like, did you move? Did you relocate? No, I didn't relocate. I just would travel different cities. I mean, he performed on the road pretty much all the time. He only spent a couple of months a year at his house in Los Angeles, so he was pretty much always going from city to city. So, you know, I was really not into school much when I started, and I, you know, would travel to see him in various cities. So, um, that's what I did. So, but I was in in Gainesville. And then I started meeting other entertainment people as well. I crashed a, um, in Atlanta, I think I was 17 also, I crashed my, to get my first movie role. And um, what happened was I was working at an ice cream parlor called Farrell's. 
and I was the person who answered the phone. And some man called and said, oh, yeah, I need to talk to Joe or whatever. And I said, oh, I have to take a message because he, he was like a dishwasher there. And um, so I took this message and the guy said, yeah, tell him to be at the audition tomorrow at three o'clock. And he gave me the address and everything. So I made a copy for myself and I gave the other copy to Joe and I showed up at the audition and it was all men in army uniforms. So I looked completely ridiculous. There's no female except the secretary at the desk. And I walk over to the desk and I said, uh, my agent told me to be here. <laughs> and um, of course I didn't have an agent. And right. she, she said, um, oh, well that's really weird. All the women were already cast. And then she looked at like some list and she goes, there was somebody who hadn't shown up at the set apparently. And she goes, do you think you're the party girl? I go, that must be it. She goes, well, you're late. You're supposed to be on the set right now. You better hurry over there. And she gave me all the information. I went to wardrobe and, and hair, and I ended up with a part in the movie. I ended up with lines. I got paid for it. And it was pretty cool. So, And I was just 17. I had to skip school that day. It's the only time I ever ditched school was to be in this movie. And I got a detention, and I didn't even care. <laughs> what was the movie? It was They Went That Away and That Away, starring Tim Conway. It was not a very popular movie, a very small movie. <laughs> Using a homeless man's identity, he once borrowed nearly $1.5 million just to see if he could. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crime, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friends. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Um, so... Well, I, I, so, okay, so that was in that, that you were still 17? Well, 17 when I did the movie thing, when I was dating Tom, I was, I, he, I was dating him from like 18, 18 to yeah. like 21, but I moved That's... to Vegas when I was 20. So I went to Florida for two years and then I was going to come to LA to go to Royal and Marymount and I had like a roommate situation like fell through. So I ended up staying in Las Vegas. I was, had gone to Vegas for the summer, and I ended up staying in Vegas and going to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, for two years. And then eventually I moved to L.A. How did the how did the Tom Jones uh, relationship end? Just um, he he broke up with me. I was devastated. And um, what had happened? We'd had a confrontation like the night before, and he had said, you know, what are you going to do if you get you know, if you got pregnant. And I said, well, I don't believe in abortion for myself. And he didn't say anything. And then the next day, his publicist or advance man, John Moran, saw me at Caesars in the lobby area and came over and said, uh, Tom can't see you anymore. I'm really sorry. And uh, please don't call. Don't try to get, you know, don't try to see him. And I was just like in tears, devastated. I went into a conference room and I'm very against violence person, but I got these, these little empty glasses off of a cart and I was like throwing them against the wall. I was really upset. And, um, but after that, like a couple of years later, I did see, you know, Tom as a friend. He did ask me out again, but by then I was dating someone else. So, you know, kind of stayed on friendly terms all these years, but it was really a, a great three years and I was really devastated at the breakup. So you went to, anyway, at some point you ended up, you said you went to L.A. or you initially you went to Vegas, but then you went to L.A.? I went to Vegas because um, I've had various experience in, experiences in Vegas as a um, tourist. <laughs> so like one thing that had happened, which was kind of interesting when I was also 17, I was staying at Caesars Palace. And um, I had been jogging down the strip. So I had my little shorts on, my tennis shoes, my waist pouch, my hair in a ponytail. I mean, I definitely was underage. And so I'm passing through Caesars Palace, and this man in his 60s comes up to me and says, I just won $13,000 gambling. I'd like to buy you a diamond bracelet, no strings attached. And I'm like, come on, you know. He takes me over to the gift shop in Caesars. And he buys me an $800 diamond bracelet, very, very small diamonds, but I was amazed. Then he said, I want to gamble. Come on, let's go gamble. So he dragged me around the casino, and every time he wins chips, he's stuffing them in my waist pouch. And I'm just like, what are you doing? And I'm in, like, disbelief. And we're being accompanied by the head of security. Caesar's head of security is, like, accompanying us. So then he says to the security guy, he says, I want to buy her some clothes. Where can I do that? 
And the guy says, oh, well, there's a, there's a clothing store right over there adjacent to the casino. So we head over there, but the security guy goes ahead of us. And so when we enter the store, he's whispering to the sales lady. So I figured there was some kind of a kickback deal probably going on. And the sales lady tells me to go to the dressing room and says, I'll bring you some nice things. So she gets all these dresses. She shows up. thought, wow, if I'm ever poor, I'm moving to Las Vegas because people right. give money away. So when I got to, and I knew a lot of people by this point, because I had gone to Vegas on multiple occasions um, when I was younger, before I moved there, and I'd seen Tom there, etc. And so I knew, like, you know, managers and people in the, in the restaurant, and I just knew a lot of people, major bees, you know, in various casinos and hotels. And um, so Caesar, somebody at Caesar's Palace, one of the... Um, I don't know, he's like one of the vice presidents or something. They have like 50 vice presidents. He said, oh, if you move to Vegas, I'll give you get you a PR job at the hotel. And so I thought, oh, okay, I'll do that for the summer. And um, because I had a, a minor in public relations at the University of Florida. So I get to Vegas for my job. I go over to his office to meet with him. And then I find out he just wants me to have sex with high rollers. Really, that's what he meant by the PR. So, of course, I didn't do it. And um, and then I was supposed to go to California, and then that fell through. So I ended up staying in Vegas, and I became a chip chat. And that was the job I invented based on the man who gave me all the stuff, which essentially you just walked in a casino, and somebody, some guy always comes over you. You immediately say, I'm not a hooker. So they know that. You set them straight at the beginning. And, um, you know, they just want people to gamble with them and talk to them and you know, you're kind of like a therapist. You're, you know, I never leave the casino or the restaurant or the showroom. It's very safe because there are a bazillion security guards in the casinos in Las Vegas. And um, and that was it. At the end of the evening, they frequently say, do you want to come to my room? And you say, I told you I'm not a hooker. I have very strict morals. And they go, oh, yeah, you did tell me that. You're right. And a lot of times they say, well, do you want to gamble with me tomorrow? Or So I made over six hundred thousand dollars in two years living in vegas when i was 20 and 21 which was a heck of a lot of money for somebody so young it was really quite amazing so when i wasn't doing the chip chatting i was like living the lifestyle of the rich and famous i was like crashing you know going backstage i got to know lots of entertainers i was flying here and there i was buying very expensive clothes and um, antique furniture and that kind of thing so it was a really interesting couple of years, and I had other jobs in Vegas. I was a cab driver. I was a backup singer for an Elvis imitator, and I was even a bodyguard for a prostitute who lived in my apartment complex downstairs, and she was very pissed off that I was making more money than her. <laughs> I didn't tell you that. I told her she should be doing chit-chatting and not being a prostitute. <laughs> you, were, you, you were a, a taxi driver? Yeah, I was a bandit cab driver, really. This was before, you know, obviously before Uber or Lyft or anything. Yeah. But what happened, I was leaving the Hilton one night, and there were always these long lines of people who had just let out of a show, out of the showroom, and they had to wait a really long time to get a cab. And um, so I thought, wait a minute, why not just, you know, take people to their hotels for pay? And so I go to the end of the line, and I can, I'll say, you know, like I can take three people, 10 bucks each, you know, whatever hotel in the strip and the people would fall and I'll go, you know, and I put them in my car and drop them off and then go back. So it was another way to make a little money when I lived in Vegas. I mean, yeah, that would be, that would be Uber now, right? So. Exactly. You were, you were, <laughs> Uber, before, you were Uber before there was Uber. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I didn't even know it was being a bandit cab driver. I didn't know it was illegal back then. I just thought I was inventing something. <laughs> so what happened, um, what around that same what, what time period was this this was in um 80 and 81 is when i was 20 and 21 years old so the 80s were very different in vegas it was um convention people it was high rollers it was very different from now which is all families and children completely different type of flavor it was very much like a small town 
Um, you could drive the strip and there wasn't a lot of traffic back then. So when I would yeah. drop people off, it was pretty easy. You just go straight to the hotel, drop them off at the front, move to the next one. And um, so, yeah, so it was, uh, it was, I mean, I would never give up my two years in Vegas. It was just amazing. And as I said, I knew like every entertainer on the strip and I would hang out in dressing rooms. I mean, Wayne Newton's dressing room was the best dressing room because he always had the most interesting people show up. He had astronauts, he had politicians, he had kings and queens, he had, you know, actors, he had just, you name it, athletes. It just didn't matter. He had all these people who just always descended on his dressing room. And so I would hang out there and he was kind of always performing somewhere at one of the hotels. So I was, you know, kind of a staple in his dressing room. And I knew a lot of, obviously, his bodyguard and some of the other people that hung around. And I, I would be there pretty frequently. I mean, maybe a couple times a week, or something like that. So it was, um, it was interesting because, you know, I was very young and I'm meeting all these accomplished people who are successful and, you know, asking them, you know, what's the key to success? And, you know, you know, I, I'm asking them about how to become someone, you know, who's a successful person in life. And I felt like I was picking up information. I was learning something. I was having these interesting experiences with people that I normally wouldn't have access to. So, um, so I, yeah, it was really cool. It was really neat. He built some of the nation's largest banks out of an estimated $55 million because 50 million wasn't enough and 60 million seemed excessive. He is the most interesting man in the world. I don't typically commit crimes, but when I do, it's bank fraud. Stay greedy, my friend. Support the channel. Join Matthew Cox's Patreon. Well, so what happened to you? Then you, you ended up in uh, L.A. I came to L.A. and um, I was a maid for my first job because I had met this guy and his son at one of the pools, you know, one of the resorts in Vegas. And he had said, if you ever move to LA, we need a housekeeper. And you could be a live-in housekeeper. And so when I moved to LA, I became their live-in housekeeper for zero pay, but I had a room to stay in. And I was a terrible housekeeper, by the way. <laughs> and I did that for a very short time. And then I started renting um, a room for a hundred dollars a month from this couple in Huntington Beach. And then after that, I became a nurse for a paraplegic, and I lived in a mobile home with this paraplegic. And um, and then after that, I moved up to the valley, and I moved in with a um, female friend. And then we were like victimized by a criminal, <laughs> um, which um, it's like two in the morning. A we we were we slept in the same bed because she only had one bed in her one bedroom apartment. And I always, I always slept in my clothes. I slept in like shorts and a shirt. And um, like two in the morning, this guy with an um, automatic, you know, semi-automatic rifle breaks down the front door, breaks down the bedroom door. I wake up and the, the gun, he's like right over the bed pointing the gun at my roommate's face. And it's so interesting to see what you do when you are under that kind of stress. And because I'm only five feet tall, I know that I can't fend him off or fight, you know, physically. So it's like I go straight into my head trying to figure out how I'm going to outsmart him. And so I just very nonchalantly said, oh, well, I'm already up. I might as well go to the grocery store, put down the covers. I very slowly put on my flip flops. I take my purse. I'm already dressed. Bang on it. I just walk right out the door and he doesn't say a word. I walk out the and I just leave her there, which is terrible. <laughs> but she gets away, and like a few minutes later, she goes, I have to go to the store with Charlotte. I have to go to the store with her. I got to go. You know, so she runs out, and we went and called the police. And uh, it was the number one news story in L.A. that day, and all these SWAT team and police officers. And they threw tear gas into the apartment and finally went in, and they found out he had killed himself right after we went to call the police. So that was my introduction to the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> what, what was the, why did he kill himself? Who was he? Like what, what was the... He knew my roommate. And I think oh. he probably, we don't really know, but we, I think he probably had a crush on her. And I think he probably thought she was with a, a guy, you know, another guy. And so when he got in there and saw it was just me, the roommate, I think he just was like, oh, you know. But now he had already broken in. He had the gun. And 
He wasn't on drugs or alcohol. He had tons of weapons in his truck, apparently, like tons of guns and ammunition. But beyond yeah. that, I have no idea, you know, I'm, and he left a bunch of money too. for all this money. There was like thousands of dollars that was like left on the dresser. And the, from when they threw the tear gas in, the window was broken. So there was all this air and the money was like flying around the room, kind of like one of those game shows where you catch the money. It was, it was kind of like that. It was just like going everywhere. It was really bizarre. And I moved out that day. I said, well, see ya. <laughs> I'm getting my own place. And, um, and that's what I did. I moved into a little single apartment in a really bad part of town. And that's where I lived with my dog that I adopted from the animal shelter. So um, that was, and, and then also I had other, you know, then there were very other jobs I had in LA that were, um, you know, were like I was a, um, a go-go dancer, essentially. I worked at one of these strip clubs, but I would never, you know, take off any clothes. I was so, I'm so conservative that I would wear like tights and a leotard and I get yelled at by the owner, but I would, you know, be a good dancer. And that's the only reason I'd be able to keep the job. So I did that for a while. And, um, and then my adopted father, you know, my abusive dad um, said, you know, if you go back to school, if I hadn't graduated, I had just stopped before I graduated. If he said, if you go back and finish college, um, I will pay for you to finish college. And um, I said, great, I'm going to do it. So I went back to school and then I ended up, you know, continuing on and getting, I got my first bachelor, then a master's, then I went back on another bachelor, another master's, and then got a PhD. So I kind of just stayed in school for a long time after that while I had different jobs from acting. And then, you know, I was doing some professional dancing and um, I became a real estate agent. So I think I know a lot about, you know, real estate and loans and all that because I think you were in that industry. And I think I was a real estate agent. I'm, I still am a real estate agent technically, but, um, and I'm with Berkshire Hathaway. But I was an agent since like 1986, I guess. So I've been an agent for you know, 30, 35 years. And um, so that's, that was kind of my main money-making profession. And I'm also a private investigator too um, for a while prior to real estate. In LA? Yeah, it was a company in um, Commerce, California called Proficiency. And uh, one of my friends from Atlanta who had gone to high school with me, she recommended me because she worked for an insurance company and mostly it was insurance work that they did. And um, so I ended up um, getting the job. I had done a couple of freelance things like um, at Screen Actors Guild, they had a notice up that they were looking for an actress to you know, help a private investigation company. So I did a couple of other freelance um, things before going to this company. So I worked there maybe for two years and as I was getting my real estate license and taking the classes and all that. And, um, and then I had my, you know, I wrote my first book at that time, which was about party crashing, meet the stars, how to meet your favorite celebrity, how to get invited to the Academy Awards. And I had been doing party crashing all along. Oh, the whole time you'd still been doing, I was kind of yeah. wondering like, when did you start doing this again? But the whole time. Yeah, no, I was doing it the whole time. And you know, when I was young, it was just kind of fun. And my friends would go to the bar or go bowling. And I'd be like, no, I'd rather hang out with the president or Michael Jackson. I mean, to me, that was more interesting. And so I had been doing it. And as I got older, I started realizing that, you know, you can lobby for legislation. You can go to an event that's $100,000 a person and, you know, talk to the senator you want to talk to or whoever it is. You can get people signed on to causes. You can, um, you know, get business partners. I used to sell some of my beaded clothes because I would design clothes at one point and I would sell them at the events. Pearl Channing bought a blouse of mine, for example, when I was at the Grammys. And so, you know, I would, you know, get different you know, connections and sometimes get acting roles or commercials or whatever. So there are just huge benefits to hobnobbing with the rich and famous and you had to crash in order to make that happen. But so how um, are you showing up? Like to me, you show up, you, you present, uh, you know, something that they've sent you of some specialized, you know, document or, or invitation of some kind that is very specific to you. You show ID, you get in like, that seems like what's, what should be happening at the door, right? I mean, <laughs> that's not what's happening at the door, though. I mean, it's 
You know, I mean, you don't have an ID normally. Normally, you just have an invitation. But it's pretty easy to get in. There are lots of different ways you can do it. I mean, I wrote a whole book on it. So um, you can, you know, walk in with a celebrity. They don't question the entourage of a celebrity normally. Um, you can just slip in. You can go in through the kitchen. You can pretend to be an entertainer and dress really outlandish, and they'll let you in a lot of the time. You can pretend you're in the orchestra and wear all black and get in. You know, there are a lot of different ways you can get into these events. And um, so I have done probably every one of those ways to get in, and, and it's been very successful. And, you know, celebrities and media people crash all the time. Regular people don't hardly ever do it, but well-known people do it constantly. They just don't, you know, a lot of people don't want to admit it if they do it because it makes it seem like they're like, oh, no, I want people to think I'm invited. I'm supposed to be here. They don't want to. I would prefer to get in and then go back to the, you know, take the elevator back down from the VIP room and tell the ordinary person, hey, you can do it too. Let me show you how to do it. And that's kind of what I always did with my book. And I write about some of the party crashing in my memoirs as well. And so, you know, I'd rather help other people, not only to meet well-known people, but just to accomplish their dreams. I mean, maybe you want to become a, a tech executive and you want to meet Bill Gates because you think he can get you a job and you want to, you know, or maybe you want to get your screenplay to Steven Spielberg or whatever it may be, you know, these techniques can help you because it's really just about how to meet people, how to get past the security to meet the VIP who can hopefully be your friend, be your date, be your business partner, whatever it is. So how did you, the, the Secret Service one, <laughs> that, that, like, what, what secrets, what events did, did you crash that were related to the Secret Service? So the Secret Service, this has got to be like the president or... Yeah, it was well, the, first, the first two times were with Reagan. And um, I know I wanted to interview Reagan for my book. And I called um, the White House initially and said, I'd like to interview President Reagan. And they laughed, said, you can't do that. And they said, he's not even doing interviews for six weeks. And I knew he was in L.A. Um, and I knew his people were staying at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And um, I called the, the, I called the, um, his press secretary. They said the press secretary is staying at the Hilton. And I talked to him, and he said, you can't interview him. He also said the same thing. So I just said, well, I'm just going to go over there and handle this myself. And so I got in the car. I drove to the Beverly Hilton. And there were these two guys out front setting up camera equipment. And um, one of them was um, like, I think he was, he was the, he was like a son of one of the CNN correspondents. And the other was this guy that was a White House photographer named Reggie. And um, I just started chatting with them and becoming their friend. And I also knew that President Reagan always went to the Walter Annenberg estate on New Year's Eve, which was like the next night. And I knew he always went to that party or that gathering. So I'm talking to these guys, and I said, so what are you guys going to do for New Year's Eve? And they said, oh, we're going to a party. And I said, well, do either of you need a date? And Reggie goes, sure, I could use a date. And then I said, and he said, but it's all the way in Palm Springs. Are you sure you want to go all the way down there? And I said, sure, no problem. And then I said, will the president be there? And he said, yes, he actually will. And so I ended up going down. I got my interview, and um it was great. I went to this event, and that was my crash. I mean, I kind of crashed by getting Reggie got me in the door, right. but that was kind of my my crash to interview Reagan. And so you, then you crashed a party to interview Ronald Reagan about your How to Crash Party book. Yeah, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted to know like, um, you know, what famous person he ever admired and that he most enjoyed meeting. And yeah, I don't remember what the questions were, but it was those types of questions that went into. You can ask him, what do you think the likelihood is somebody could crash this party? <laughs> exactly. I didn't ask that, but that would have been a good question. <laughs> so that was, the, that was one of the crashes. And then another one was when um, Senator Kerry was running for president. So I got past security to, to, to the green room where everybody was located. So that was kind of an amazing, because I was like the only non-famous person in the room. And it was, you know, it was like Robert De Niro and, you know, Barbara Streisand and Leonardo DiCaprio and Ben Affleck. I mean, it was literally everybody and me, you know, I really stood out. And then the, um, the last time was with um, Obama. He had a fundraiser at George Clooney's house and it was 40,000 per person. And so, um, 
I basically got up to the house by pretending to make a, a pharmaceutical delivery when they stopped me and Secret Service stopped me in my car because they had the street blocked off. And um, I had like ponytail holders in this little sack and I was praying they would not look in the sack because there was nothing pharmaceutical in there. And I said, no, I have this delivery for a G. Clooney and they didn't know what to do. They were just like looking around, like, do we let her go? Do we not? And finally they said, okay, I guess you can go up. So I went up. I had to park in his driveway because there was nowhere to park. It was filled up with catering trucks and stuff. And so that's how I got into the $40,000 per person event. And, um, but you know, it's funny because in California, if you get caught or you get in trouble for party crashing, the worst they can do for a first offense is an infraction. It's not even a misdemeanor. It's a $75 ticket. It's like a parking ticket. And then every other time that you get caught, the worst thing they can do to you, a $250 ticket. That's it. Infraction. So it's like, you're thinking like, gee, a hundred thousand dollars to get in or a $75 ticket. Hmm. Let me right. think about that. <laughs> so it's kind of a no-brainer, actually. Right. So, how's your book sell? It did well. It did fine. It was with um, Ross. Book. The first book was with Ross Book. I did a lot of press on it. So I was on my first show was Oprah, which was a terrible nice. show to be on first because it was such a big show, and I had never been on TV before. So I thought I did a really bad job. But I did Larry King Live. I did a bunch of, of press. Set it all up myself. My publishing house didn't set any of it up. And um, and it was a lot of fun. I toured the country. I did book signings. And yeah. And that was also the time when I was meeting my birth family. I had tracked down my mom and my dad. And so um, when I was doing my book signings is when I met, I went to Florida to meet my mom and my grandmother and my two aunts and everybody the first time. So that's kind of a separate story in and of itself is tracking down the birth family. <laughs> were you, were you married at this time or this was still? No, I wasn't married. And, um, I, you know, I've always been like, um, you know, just hardly ever been interested in any guy. I'm just like very picky. So like if I'm interested in somebody, I'm very focused on him and no one else. And then it could be like five years before I even see another guy I like again after, he breaks up because I never broke up. They always broke up with me, you know, after. So I dated like, um, I guess I've been interested in like six guys in my life, including my husband. And when I saw my husband, um, it was, I was much older. I was 39 um, when we got married. So I was 34 when I met him. And it was through a dating organization. It was one of the brick and mortar organizations called Great Expectations, which is from way back before internet dating. Yeah. And I saw a video of him. They had like videos of all the um, the guys and girls. You do like a little interview, and then would also have a, a, a booklet with their pictures and bio information. And when I first saw his video, I was like already in love with him. I made very fast decisions, you know, and I was just like totally excited about him. But I had been through like tons of dates before I met him and I was so burnt out on it. I mean, very nice guys, but I just wasn't interested in them. And I had gone up to um, the women at the front desk and I said, you know, it's exactly what I'm looking for. And they took me over to the books and they said, well, this guy, and he had like the gold chains and he's standing next to the Corvette. I was like, no, that's not what I said I wanted. And then the next day I came and the manager was there and I told him what I was looking for. And he said, well, we only have one guy that fits that description. I said, one guy out of thousands of guys, because there were a lot of people in this organization. He goes, this one guy. And that's when he showed me my husband's picture. And the pictures were kind of like a little questionable, but when I saw the video, I was like ecstatic. And so I picked him and asked him out and he said yes. And, you know, and then, you know, we went through off and on stuff through the years and then eventually he proposed marriage and you know so <laughs> yeah and this was still you're still in california yeah i've been in california ever since like 19 um right after i left vegas so like 1982 or so so i've been in california all that time yeah so you got married you had a daughter i had a daughter i got the, i had the daughter before i was married I was okay mom. so her father lives in new york and um, so, um, so she visits. She's actually going back to see him for Thanksgiving. And um, I had dated him for about a year and a half. 
And then when I got pregnant, he freaked out and I wasn't willing to have an abortion. And we had discussed if I got pregnant, but we just kept seeing each other and never resolved it. And so, um, so I had her for, and I was raising her on my own. And, um, and then like when she was, I don't know, eight or nine years old, um, I, I was sending like every year I'd send pictures and some information to his parents because they were kind of the heads of the family and some information to his parents because they were kind of the heads of the family. So I figured they could distribute the information about Kayla to the rest of the family. And, um, so one year when I sent the pictures, the mother wrote a note back saying, please don't send these anymore. You're upsetting our family. And I was like, excuse me. So I sued for child support. I hadn't asked for child support for all those years. And he was a very wealthy guy with trust funds from a very wealthy family. And so I was so pissed. I said, fine, you're paying child support. And I was really glad I did it too, because he finally cared about meeting her. You know, he never sure. wanted to meet her before, but once he started paying, he was like, well, I want to meet her. I said, great. I want you to meet her. I want her to have a relationship with her dad because he's, he's basically a great guy. I mean, I, you know, and we have a good relationship, friendship, you know, and um, so, you know, I never had any negative thing to say about him other than the fact that he didn't meet his daughter for like 10 years. But, um, but now, you know, he's flown, he flies her to New York twice a year. He did for many years and, um, you know, he gets, she gets along with everybody in his family and she's accepted and it's great. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I mean, during this period of time, what are, what are you doing for work? I mean, you're married. Um, yeah, I was a real estate agent was my main job. That's always been my main money making, but I was, you know, writing books and I was getting my PhD during this time. And so I always had lots of things going on, but for money, I was, um, an agent and I, um, I, I never have qualified for a loan <laughs> yeah. ever because my income ratio, it just doesn't work. So like when I bought my first house, I had, I wasn't an agent yet when I bought my first house. And I had been renting this apartment. It was super cramped and super, you know, just horrible. And um, and so I, you know, I told my friends and my 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 evil dad, as I affectionately called him, my adoptive dad. I said, I'm gonna buy. I want to buy a house. And everybody's like, Oh, you're gonna lose it. Don't do it, etc. And um, so what happened was I opened this antique shop because when my mom died, I inherited the furniture. I got no money, but I inherited all the junk. You know, like the broken toaster and the sofa and my adoptive dad just kind of gave me this stuff. So I opened an antique shop to sell all the stuff and I got enough money for a down payment for a no qualifying loan that they had them back in those days at good rates. And so um, I, you know, I bought this house for $138,000 in Van Nuys, California, not the greatest neighborhood, but it was four bedrooms. And then there was an area that I could make into a guest unit. So I rented out the guest unit for $500. And then my mortgage, tax, and insurance all together was $300 a month. And the apartment I was living in was $650 a month. So to me, it was like stupid if I didn't buy the house. But everybody was like, don't buy it, don't buy it. So I bought it. And that's where I started raising Kayla. And then when I moved out, um, I started kind of buying other property here and there. But I was never like a wealthy landlord. I was just like a small landlord. So I have a couple of rentals now and, you know, just kind of make it from month to month because I've never been a money-oriented person. It's more about trying to do things to, you know, make the world better, to be an opinion person, to, you know, write a book or try to write an op-ed or, you know, there are other things that I always felt were more important. So, um, yeah, so that's what happened. I moved out and... We bought a house in Sherman Oaks, and then, yeah, uh, then my husband came, and we lived in Sherman Oaks for a little while in a very small house. It was like 1,200 square feet, very tight, and, um, and then kind of moved on from there. Okay. So what, what happened with the, uh, the Hunter Moore um, situation? This is when your, your daughter is like... She's a teenager. She's what, 15, 16 years old? Or no, something? she's actually 24. She was... Oh, she, she was, oh, okay. Yeah, so she was, so she had been taking some pictures in her room, and she was living with me. We were living in Woodland Hills at the time, and um, she was taking pictures in her room, and she took a one topless picture and a lot of other cutesy shots, and her um, phone got full, so she sent them to her email to save them, 
and then she was hacked. And then after getting hacked, her topless picture showed up on Hunt for More's website, isanyoneup.com, along with her name, her city, and her social media link. And she was at her waitress job when she found out, and she was just freaked out and felt violated and exposed and was in tears. And she called me, and I had never heard of revenge porn before, so I look at the website, I see the pictures. They had several pictures of her, but one was topless, the others were like, her on the red carpet and different pictures of her. And, um, you know, I knew we had to get it down because I know what happens on the internet. Things just, you know. What, when was this? What year? This was in, um, well, it was like 10 years ago. So it was in 2012 is when it happened. Okay. So it was 2012. It was January 2012, actually, is when it happened. And, um, so first, um, Kayla and I sent um, an email to Hunter asking him to remove this picture, which I knew he wasn't going to do because I had I was investigating, and so I could kind of see what he was saying to other people, which is right. the content. Yeah, and, it wasn't hard to figure out his character. Exactly. Right. So, um, and then I was I started um, contacting people associated with him, um, like his publicist and his attorney, and. Um, his internet security company, and even tried to call his mom because I thought she could probably do something. But I found her former workplace, but she didn't live there anymore. I didn't work there anymore. So I talked to her associates, but it got back to Hunter because he posted on Twitter, somebody just called my mom's workplace. You know, she thinks it's really funny, ha ha, or something. So um, I did that. I, we went to the Los Angeles Police Department and met with this middle-aged female detective who said to Kayla, why would you take a picture like this if you didn't want it on the internet? And I said, you know, you're victim blaming. And I said, if she had taken um, a Polaroid and stuck it in the dresser drawer and someone broke in and stole the picture, would you, you know, blame her or would you do your job and arrest the criminal? And she just, you know, sighed and gave me a look and went to get forms. And then I told Kayla we'd call the FBI. And I did call the FBI when I got home. And they wanted me originally just to file a report online, which I figured was because they're just so busy. And um, so I said, I see you help Scarlett Johansson when she gets hacked, but you don't help the average person. And they sighed, and then they said, you know, transferred me to a detective, and that person told me there would be three agents coming to my house later in the month. And so, um, and then in the meantime, I was curious about the hacking scheme. I thought there was one. Because, because your daughter, she had no idea how he had gotten these pictures, right? right. Or, never sent it to anybody, and she never would have sent it to anyone. And she also found one of her female friends on the site, and she called her, and this girl said, I was hacked. I, the only person who had my picture is my husband. She was, like, newly married. And so I thought, well, this is really weird. Here's this website. I only know two people on it, and they were both hacked. So I started doing a survey of my own to find out how people got on that site. And so I called 40 people who had been posted within the two-week period that Kayla was posted. And um, it was very hard because I didn't want to use the computer or any sort of electronics because I was scared that the hacker might be on there. So everything had to be done by phone. And it was really hard. So I'd have, like, sometimes the person's first and last name, and I'd have their city. And then I'd call people with the same last name and say, are you related to this person? Can you have them call me? So it was very roundabout. But by the end of my study, I found out that 40% of them said they'd been hacked. And we knew that it was the same hacker in some cases as Kayla had because the hacker was leaving behind this email address, right? So um, so I gave all that information to the FBI when they showed up. It was like a 12-inch file of all their data and phone numbers for victims and emails and you know, all sorts of information. And um, they originally, when they came, said they didn't think they'd be able to take the case because they said they normally only take cases that involve large losses of money. And um, we didn't have that. And they also said it takes over a year to complete an investigation. And... Um, but luckily, they took the case, and um, it started plugging along. And um, and I got then Kayla's picture came down. I got Kayla's picture down. Actually, my husband kind of did. First, I got it down through um, Black Lotus Communications and this president named Jeffrey Lyons, and they were the cybersecurity for Hunter's website. And I talked to him, and I said, "There's hacking scheme," and so he blocked Kayla's page. 
But Hunter, being as malicious as he was, he went around the block and created a whole new page for Kayla. So then I talked to Jeffrey and he said, yeah, he went around the block, but we're going to try blocking the photos and see if that works. And so in the meantime, my husband had finally agreed to help. And he talked to Hunter's attorney. And because it was an attorney talking to an attorney, the attorney was able to get Hunter to take Caleb's picture down. But of course, all the other victims are still up there. And so... I mean, I got to get those down. I, and I knew it was a cause at this point. I was like, this, we have no legislation on this. This is crazy. All these people are being victimized. So I, I knew there was a lot of work ahead, not only getting helping them, but getting the site down, trying to get laws passed. I mean, I just knew I had a long road ahead. And well, uh, yeah. like I can get, I can get sent, you know, like voluntarily giving someone the photos and putting them up and everything. But I mean, the big deal is that they're being stolen. You know that they're, they're it's a it's an organized hacking scheme to acquire photos and put them up, and then the people complain and he won't take them down. Like I mean, it it, it seems like he would have been if he had been smart, he'd have just anybody who complained, he'd have just taken taken the photos down, and he could have avoided all this. But it, his arrogance mm -hmm. has just derailed his entire little little enterprise that he had going. Right. You know, if he had just tried, if he had just worked with you and just taken the, I mean, obviously he shouldn't have been breaking the law to begin with, but breaking the law and being an asshole about it is <laughs> not the way to go. It's true. You know? You know, but, I think that it's also a problem just posting people's images non-consensually. So, I mean, I felt very strongly that that's not something that should be legal. And even though it was really, it was copyright violation. So he actually was breaking the law even before the hacking. Because you're supposed to take it down within 72 hours per the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and he was not taking photos down. So he was already breaking the law, but it's usually a civil suit with that particular law. Right. But you, you can sue for 250000 per photo. So you could civilly get quite a big amount of money, except Hunter Moore had no money. So he yeah. didn't care about civil suits. Yeah, so, he was with his mother. Exactly. And exactly. pretends to have money. Exactly. Exactly. So um, his attorney had said he had to take the, he had told me that he's going to have to take the site down if he's under investigation because they're going to use it against him. And that's exactly what they were doing. In the meantime, um, this other guy, James McGivney, also wanted to get the site down. So he bought the domain, the isanyoneup.com, and had it directed to his website. And that brought the site down. But of course, we were worried that he was going to just repost it under a different domain because... And, he, and then he started threatening to do that and said he was going to bring it back under huntermore.tv, but he was going to make it worse because he was not only going to put all the same original content up, but he was going to put the home address of victims with driving directions on how to get to their houses. And, you know, during all this time, you know, I have come out as his enemy. I mean, I have accused him of hacking publicly, his family, his followers who were you know, they were the children, he was the father, they would say, I will kill for you, father, what do you want me to do? All these devoted people in his right. world were coming after me. So I was getting death threats, I was getting computer viruses, and they even had a stalker come to my house. So it was like crazy through the roof, crazy. And so when he um, claimed he was going to bring the site back, I decided to put his home address on Twitter so everything went ballistic when I did that. And Hunter made threats against me and his followers made even more threats against me. And that's when Anonymous came to my rescue. <laughs> you know, the underground group Anonymous? Yeah, yeah. That I <laughs> so then I got contacted by one of them who said, don't worry, we're going to protect you. We're going after him tomorrow and we're going to dox him and we're going to, you know, and they ended up apparently uh, making him officially dead in the state of California for a month and sent him like 200 dildos and did all these things. So um, he was very quiet after that. He was like super afraid of Anonymous. It was like you didn't hear anything from him once Anonymous came after him. So um, so yeah, they came to the rescue and uh, eventually the FBI raided and then arrested. And um, he was originally looking at 42 years of prison and so was the hacker. But um, he did a plea deal and uh, got, you know, got two and a half years, but he actually didn't serve that much. Time and he was, you know, in pretty low security. Um, I understand the place in Texas was kind of more like a camp where 
the so-called inmates can walk up to the store by themselves, get what they want, and come back. So, you know, and I think a lot of this was alcohol rehab type centers. So, anyway, but he's out. He's back on certain social media sites and um, making racist comments and anti-gay comments and sexist comments and um, not doing any revenge porn, to my knowledge. But, um, but anyway, after all this happened, I started meeting with legislators to try to get laws passed. And we have laws now in 48 states, and we're trying to get a federal law passed. We've had a lot of trouble with that, but we're working on that. Yeah, um, I think Dan, uh, Dan did, no, I don't think, I know, I know Dan interviewed him. Oh, um, yeah, he did a couple of times, like two or three times. Yeah, um, yeah. and Dan and I talked to him. I actually did a, a, I'm trying to think, is that the one where, that must have been the, the video that uh, I did with Dan where your name came up. Um, you know who else contacted me? Who was the the girl or the woman that was helping run his site? Forget oh, Amanda. Name. Amanda. Yeah. Like yeah. she contacted me. Yeah. Yeah, she and... contacted me too on um, a while back, and we had a conversation <laughs> on the phone. So yeah. Yeah, I I asked her if she wanted to be interviewed. She, you know, didn't. Okay. Um, just wanted to tell me that some of the things that Dan said were inaccurate, and I was like, "Well, then come on the show. Like, what's you know?" Right. Like, I'm not trying to make I. And honestly, I don't. I don't. You know, the problem is, and I'm sure you. You know, having having been in articles and having written a book and having been on television, you know, we seldomly see ourselves the way we are or the way other people see us, whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. And so anytime somebody says something about you, you know, you're typically immediately offensive. And, and I don't, I don't know that Dan was trying to be offensive, but I, I'm often offensive to people just because I'm just saying what I think. And I'm not thinking that that's an offensive thing that I'm saying. Right. But. Well, I do were, remember one thing he said is he said, which is complete lie. Because, you know, my husband is 20 years older than me, and I always liked older guys. I mean, I just have always liked older guys. Right. Except he said, oh, she just married him for his money, which is completely not true. I mean, my husband was renting a room and a house for $100 a month when I met him. He had no property, nothing. I had several rental houses when I met right. him. You know, it was just completely not true. And that was, you know, a lie because he didn't even ask me about my personal life or my husband. Probably just, it's an assumption on his part. Yeah, you know? but it's a Texas assumption that, oh, some young woman, obviously she's just after his money, and then he's just looking for a trophy for, you know, that's like a, a sexist assumption that society makes, you know? I, I understand. I'm, I hear you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying, you know, it's probably just an assumption, but but it, listen, even if it were tr remotely true, not that it is, you would have been offended. Even if it was, even if you could see it that way, you would be offended. Like, when people have described me, or, like, I'll get offended. Initially, when I would be in newspapers or articles, I was always super offensive, uh, offended by things that were being said. But then, the more as time went on and I read more and more and I started writing, I was like, well, how else were they going to see it? You know, not that what he said, because he was clearly wrong, but I'm saying a lot of times it's hard to see yourself, even how you really are. People would describe me as a con man or, a, you know, a master criminal or a fraudster. I would always get offended and I'd, I'd go, and then I'd get kind of. I had to think about it and go, bro, you're ripping off banks and you're committing, you're running scams. Like, <laughs> how else are they going to describe you? <laughs> you know, you know, oh God, well, if you don't want people to describe you as a scumbag, well, stop being a scumbag. Right. You know? So, um, anyway, I, uh, so I, I'm just saying that, like, I would love to interview, you know, Hunter. He would never be interviewed, but then I, I think there was a lot of things that came out of that interview where Dan was, you know, absolutely right. Like, like this guy, he has, does not seem to have the ability to t take responsibility and say, hey, that is, was a scumbag mood, you know, move. I, you know, and, and try and look into why he was behaving that way. Instead, he's just, he's just absolutely unwilling to backpedal. He tries to say the right thing. Like I've seen some interviews and he'll try and say the right thing and then immediately say something that contradicts it. Right. It's like you, you, you know, why, why you just, you know, look at it and realize that that was not the way to behave and apologize. And typically if you're honest about things and apologize, people forgive you. That's people right. want to forgive you. 
Yeah. If you're genuine, the, the work, the problem is people can tell whether you're genuine or not. Mm-hmm. And so you can try and fake it and they might, they might be like, okay, but deep down they know, like intuition is a mother fire. Like you have to admit, like, you know, you, your daughter will come in and say, hi, how are you doing? And walk to, you, to her room, but you know something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Nothing happened. She right. did the same thing she always does, but for some reason, you know, whether, it, you know, people say a mother's intuition, but it's just intuition in general. You know mm-hmm. when something's wrong with your husband, with your daughter, with a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Like every time I have ever, you know, cheated on someone or been cheated on, they always knew. They always knew before they had evidence. They just felt it. Mm-hmm. And that's just intuition. And it's the same thing, like it was Hunter, even though he's trying to say the right things, he doesn't genuinely feel that way. Yeah. You can just feel it. People know. Right. Well, so I, 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 the only thing he'd do differently is jack it up 10 times harder. And, um, he, oh, yeah, that was his like, thing. Everybody except himself. He blames his attorney, he blames the hacker, probably blames me. And yeah, he has no remorse whatsoever. So the interviews are boring, though. Honestly, you really don't want to interview him. I mean, I watched. It was grueling to get through those interviews. I was just like so bored. I was like falling asleep going, I don't know why anybody would want to interview him because he has nothing to say. It's just like the same old, same old, you know. Well, that, that's the thing is that to, to me, if, like if you, if he was going to come on and just say the same thing, like, like I, I don't want to, you know, like I, I don't want to hear how, you know, you go 10 times harder and you're the man and, mm-hmm. you know, what's he got? God, there's, so, there's just so, he's just, you know, he, he really is like a 13 year old boy. Mm-hmm. He I mean, said, I think he hasn't grown up. That's the main reason I wanted him to go to prison is I thought he'll grow up and he'll stop behaving this way and he'll get a uh-huh. different mindset. He'll mature. But he no. didn't mature. I mean, he's, what, 36 years old now. It's really surprising. And, you know, it's such bad PR for him to act the way he is. I mean, you're right. People, a certain segment of the population would forgive him if he would sincerely apologize. And then he would have some people who actually liked him, you know, authentic genuinely yeah so um it's, it's really amazing to me that he doesn't see how it's bad pr at the very least you know well you were definitely i, I just remember watching it and thinking well, this this woman is this dude's worst nightmare like he just crossed the wrong person and it, it's funny because i i wrote a book about a guy and his brother was counterfeit well no he was counterfeiting credit cards his brother was running up run using the credit cards and typically, you get an alert. Someone used your credit card. They shut the credit card down. They were, they they send you the the money back. Fine, you know, no harm, no foul. Mm-hmm. Um, this and he had been doing this for days. He'd run up. I forget what it was. If I, it was, it wasn't a lot. It was maybe seven or eight thousand dollars. It for over a course of a day, he'd run up on this one credit card. And with, but the when the woman was notified, the bank told her. Don't worry, we're gonna pay. We're, you don't have to pay for it. We're gonna reimburse it, and it's fine. But she wouldn't accept that. She was like, "No, no. Where was it used? That target down the street. Where's the local police station? Let me call." She meet makes the officers meet her there. Walk, look at the camera. Follow him back to his car. Get his tag number. Tracks him back to it to his apartment. He's only lived down the street. Goes there. It, and, and I just remember, and I was reading, I was in prison, I was reading the police report, and I was like, this woman is this guy's worst nightmare. Like, I think that's great. I love that. <laughs> it, was, it was great. And, you know, this guy was so, he was so sharp that the, the police officer knocked on the door, opened the door, and there's all these Target bags, and all, all the stuff that he had to list of. It's all right there, and he's like, yes? And he's like... You, Hot. <laughs> and I have a black and white photo of you from the security, but like, are you so-and-so? Yes, why are you here? He's like, yeah, okay, well, here's why. <laughs> that's great. I love that. <laughs> but it just, your story, that, that just, the, the, the documentary, the interview with you just totally reminded me of that. Um, <laughs> but, so, so what are you doing now? You're still in just, you're, you're, you're doing, um, um, you're just, you're a real estate agent, you own some property, or that's still what's going on, or are you doing yeah, anything? Yeah, I mean, I'm technically still an agent with Berkshire Hathaway. Um, I haven't been doing too much real estate lately because I've been doing a lot of interviews and I'm working on a couple of books. So I'm, again, doing lots of other things. But 
Yeah, and I um, counsel victims. I've talked to over 500 victims in the past 10 years. And so people call me with, you know, situations. Um, it's been weird lately because ever since the documentary, I'm getting people contacting me saying nothing to do with revenge porn. They're saying, like, my grandmother's been missing for three months. Can you find her for me? I mean, you wouldn't believe the calls I get that, oh, I lost custody of my kids. Can you get them back for me? And so people somehow think I, I have the ability to do all sorts of things that I have no experience in. But um, I have been talking to victims when possible and trying to give them, you know, clues as to what they can do. And um, we have a hotline in the United States at the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. And then the Cyber Civil Rights Legal Project have um, attorneys all over the country who will help victims for free. So that's a good resource if someone wants an attorney. They can just do a Google search on that and try to find somebody that will take their case if, if they're in that situation. Okay. What are the books you're working on? I'm working on a book. Um, the first one is a, an academic book um, called Omniocracy, which is about a government with representation for all living beings. So it's a very much a philosophy book about animal advocacy and having love and respect for all living beings and um, you know, as, as being of equal value and worthy of equal consideration to humans. And then the other book is a book about Baruch Spinoza and um, he was a 17th century philosopher, so it's gonna, it's kind of a nonfiction novel based on his life and, um, you know, a lot of activity. He was um, a, a heretic, you know, because he was, he didn't agree with the, the church and he had these radical views and their view it was radical. Today it wouldn't be considered radical at all. So um, he was, you know, um, ousted from the synagogue. He was actually Jewish, but he was ousted from the synagogue and excommunicated, and people tried to kill him, and the authorities were after him, and you know, and this was during the witch burning and all that going on. So I'm doing also a book on that. So those are two of the main projects that I'm, and then I have a screenplay I just finished also. So I'm just working on different writing projects, um, as well as you know, a little bit of real estate here and there. <laughs> okay, well, um, can you think of anything else you want to? talk about or go over no i mean it's it's no it's fine i mean <laughs> <laughs> I whatever you even, say you're the host whatever I, you say i can't think of anything else um okay. so you lived in florida and you were in atlanta right are you from florida no i'm from i'm from tampa florida and i lived here until I and mean, i was born in tampa and i you know in 2000 and late 2000 Three, the uh, FBI showed up and wanted to arrest me, and I wasn't super excited about that. So I went on the run for three years, and I was caught in late 2006. And then I went to prison for 13 years. Wow. And I got out three years ago and kind of, you know, tried to kind of reboot my life. Uh -huh. um, you know, while I was in prison, I wrote, gosh, a couple dozen synopses, true crime synopses, you know, uh, just short stories, mm -hmm. you know, between nine, probably six or 7,000 and maybe 12, 15,000 words, you know, and I, seven of those I turned into books. Oh, wow. That's great. So, you, you know, made good I, use of your time in prison. Yeah, I did. I, I optioned the life rights of several of the, in, my in, fellow inmates, um, got some guys in Rolling Stone magazine. Mm -hmm. That one's been optioned like four times, got a book deal like from uh skyboards publishing but then when i got out i just i just self-published you know it's honestly i make so much more money self-publishing than i do yeah, a lot of times you can yeah and a lot of yeah, the things but, don't really push your book so you kind of have to do all no. the power yourself right, anyway. so if, you're doing it all, if you're doing it anyway exactly you might as well get all the money right so do i want to make a dollar 15 a book or do you want to make 650 a book right you know right. so um, and you know, because of the, because I, I, because of my, the YouTube channel, you know, people buy the books constantly. Like I don't actually ever talk about the, the books really, mm -hmm. but just people tend to look into me and my name's out there. So, you know, the, the books are constantly selling and, mm -hmm. um, and I'm always working on stuff and I've got a, a couple of the books, a couple of the stories have been obviously, well, a couple, it's like four or five, five of them have been optioned, but but some right. of them are being turned into uh, documentaries. Uh-huh. And um, 
you know, that's, you know, it's such a long process. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I have, um, you might be interested actually in the story of my grandfather, because I have, in addition to my two memoirs, um, Rebel in High Heels and Undercover Debutante, I wrote a book called Devil in the Basement. And so when I tracked down my birth family, I found out my grandfather had been killed by a devil worshiper in 1948. And it's a super amazing story. So I wrote a book about that called Devil in the Basement. And um, he, it was like double murder, suicide, set off two bombs. It was like crazy in this small town in West Virginia. And my grandfather was also Italian. So he was the victim of prejudice because the prejudice against Italians was horrible back in the 1930s and 1940s. In fact, the largest lynching ever in the United States was not against African Americans, it was against Italians, 11 people killed at one time. And so my grandfather was kicked out of two law offices. He was an attorney. He had risen up from poverty and um, his brothers and sisters were like in the coal mines and all these menial jobs. But he became an attorney and was kicked out for being Italian. And then he finally moved to kind of the wealthier side of town, you know, the upper middle income side of town. And the CCNR said no Italians, no black, no, you know, whatever. And uh, he was kicked out of his house. And the KKK sent a letter saying, you know, basically with a little clipping of, of a family, they had set a house on fire in California and the whole family had died and they sent this little clipping with the letter. And so he moved his family back to the poor side of town. And then after that, he was killed by a devil worshiper, a guy who lived like two blocks away from the house where he moved. And um, it's, it's really an amazing story, but that that is um, part of my natural family that I found. <laughs> Did you research this whole thing? Or I like... did. It took me five years. I interviewed over 100 people. I went back to West Virginia a couple of times. I got pictures. I got pictures of a gun. Um, he set off these bombs in his basement. So I have pictures of the, you know, the, the damaged basement, which they never repaired. He carved Hell's Half Acre into his property and deeded it to the devil. He named his boat Hell the Poppin'. He had a life-size satanic doll which is really quite amazing because there were only two other life-size satanic dolls prior to him in the history of the world that I could find. And the first one was this woman named Helen Duncan in England who had a doll named Peggy, and she would do seances with Peggy. And she got a lot of press, so you might have heard of her. And then there was another guy who was only three hours away who is reportedly started the first satanic coven, and his name was Dr. Herbert Sloan, and he had... Um, a life-size doll, and he was very into his, it was April Bell, I believe her name, and he was like was talking to his doll and saying she communicated with him, and so yeah. I believe that it's possible that Ernie, the guy that killed my grandfather, knew Herbert Sloan, he certainly knew of the other dolls, because he made this very creepy life-size doll, and it was on the front page of the newspapers back then, it was like, it's like really creepy. So it's a really cool story, and um, and I met relatives of you know of, of, I talked to his relatives on the phone. I met relatives of his wife who he had killed, and um, you know other people in the town is his died. wife who the who the the Satan worshiper yeah, had he killed? killed his wife also. He had been beating his wife, and then he ended up killing her after he killed. Well, actually, before he killed my grandfather, he killed his wife, and then he tried to kill himself, but he failed. And um, at first he failed, so they took him to the hospital. And then my grandfather's younger brother, who was just really like freaked out and angry, got a gun and went to the hospital to kill the devil worshiper. And he runs in there, you know, waving his gun, and everybody's scared and hiding. And then he like jumps over the counter and where is he? And he runs to the room. And luckily, the devil worshiper had died like a few minutes before, because otherwise John would have been arrested. I mean, his whole life would have been ruined because he shot this guy. So that's that story. And then my, his sister, Rose, same family. There were like nine kids, so there were lots of, lots of, lots of kids in that big Italian family. Rose was dating. She was the mistress of one of the top Detroit mobsters, Billy Jack Jackaloni. And so she was dating him, and he is the person who the FBI say probably killed Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, to this day, he's the number one suspect. So I have like a sub story about Rose and Billy Jack in the story as well. So it's really an amazing story, and that was something, you know. And I learned I was Italian, which I thought was really cool. I was very proud of my Italian blood, and I found out, you know, a lot of things that 
in my family are very, you know, my birth family are very similar to me. You know, my birth mom, my birth, birth dad, I have a brother and sister. They didn't even know they had a sibling until like maybe eight years ago, I met them for the first time. So, you know, I have this whole new family. So, you know, I, you know, I used to recruit people to be family members, but now I have my birth family and I talk to my birth mom probably like every other day or every three days on the phone. So um, we have a pretty close relationship and I see her, you know, she flies out and that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, I, well, I was going to say, I have uh, the website that I have, I have a, a, well, most of the short true crime stories on the website and then the books I, I have on, uh, on yeah, check them out. yeah, that's really cool. I mean, it sounds like you've had great success with all of your writing. So I congratulate you. That's fabulous. Well, I, it's very hard getting things optioned and you know, all of this is not that easy. So I think that's fabulous that you've accomplished all of that. Well, I'm just trying to think like if you, if you scale those down, you know, if you ever want to scale down any of the, uh, the true stories into a very short, you know, version, you know, uh, you could always put it on, I could always post it on my website. So if you want to take a look at it, it's called InsideTrueCrime.com. Okay. So, you know, if you want, um, oh, and there, it's funny too, because it's funny how often, even though there's a book or somebody will contact me, a producer or something, I, I just send them to the website because like, I know they're not going to read a 300 page book. Right. But they will read, you know, what, what amounts to a 15 page article. Mm -hmm. or 10, 10 or 15 page article, which is, you know, they're whatever, 9,000 words. Right. You can't ask them to read 90,000, but they'll read nine. Listen, I've gone so far to make it easy for, for producers. Um, I, I've even made a, um, had, had every one of the stories on the website is narrated. Oh. Because it's like, yeah. hey, you can, it takes 45 minutes or it takes an hour. You can listen to it on your way to work. Right. Like I know. You know, I try and put pictures up so that I let them know, hey, look, you know, and everybody's super handsome or, you know, <laughs> like very flashy story. Like, um, but none of my stories really are, uh, have any uh, murders or anything because I, I don't know why I just have a, a kind of, well, they do, but none of my lead characters have murders. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there may be a murder involved in the story, but they never are the, the actual murder. Right. Um, but I was going to say yours is... Um, you know, that's one of those things that you can researching an older story like that. Like it really can take, especially if you shorten it, you have to eliminate sort certain storylines and simplify things. And mm -hmm. you can really shape that story, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, being a writer, you know, that like you could write your story as being, you know, this adventurer, you could write another one as a love story. You could write, everybody's got multiple, um, memoirs inside of them. I agree. Yeah. You know? I totally agree. And you yeah. learn a lot about yourself, too, when you write a memoir. You really do kind of, like, oh, yeah. come to realizations that you didn't think about before. And so it's really kind of really helps your life. And I would encourage everybody to write at least one memoir. Yeah, definitely. I definitely think uh, writing in general helps you think, helps you learn how to think strategically. And, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, definitely, definitely writing helps. Because, you know, it's the first time I think I, I was in prison and ever kind of did, you know, self, you know, um, inflection you know really looked at myself and said hey you know you've made some major mistakes <laughs> like you kind of are so mad bro like that was what were you thinking like you knew better than that you know and I, I don't think that those are things I ever thought about before and, and never would have yeah but I've not forced myself to sit down and write a memoir mm -hmm. and you know, then suddenly all those things that mean things that people had said about me were like ah yeah he's, he's pretty much right on that he, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he hit that on the head yeah <laughs> So, but, um, anyway, listen, I, I appreciate you talking with me. Yes, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks um, for having me on the show. Sure. No problem. If you want to, uh, if you want to email me, um, any links to your, your stories, um, do that and I'll put those in the description. Okay. And you know, like this little interaction, like they're not going to cut out. He'll, he'll leave this. So anybody who wants to, you know, look up any of your uh, books and, and buy them on Amazon, I'm sure they're all on Amazon, right? Yeah, they are. Yeah. You know, buy them on Amazon. You know, I'll have the links in the description. Um, and yeah, that uh, that's it. I, I appreciate it. And Thanks a lot. <laughs> good, good job with Hunter Moore. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks. Okay.
appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. And if you like the video, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Leave me a comment in the comment section. Uh, also, if you want to join my Patreon, uh, the Patreon will be in the description. I will have all of uh, Charlotte Law's um, links to her books. And, you know, I appreciate it. Share the video. And uh, thank you very much for checking it out. I will see you.